So, um, I think the topic was, uh, um, the Buddha's advice on sustaining a favorable relationship. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm sure, um, this is a topic that probably is been spoken about or aspects of it has been spoken about again and again and many people are aware these are things that we have probably experienced since we remember our times right even since our time in the kindergarten we start our interactions with our people our friends friends, our teachers, our parents, our siblings, right? So all of these things are relationships. So I recall um, one day when we were on a highway going past, uh, like going under a bridge, and there's always like graffiti, right, on the walls. And in there I read, bombs don't kill people, but words do. There was a, a graffiti of a bomb there. In the beginning, I thought, no, that's not true. Bombs do actually kill people. <laughs> but then I realized the power of that statement, because it's not always, but the power of the words, yeah? Not to literally kill a person, but we feel like dead, right? Sometimes because of one word. Sometimes these days, even one emoji is enough, isn't it, <laughs> to change our mood. We could be flying into the clouds with happiness, or <laughs> we could be completely finished. Yeah, it's very powerful, the communication. The interaction with people is extremely a very powerful um, thing that affects us, either positively or or negatively, I mean, if you think about the positive, like the interaction with somebody like Ajahn Brahm, or if the Buddha was around the Buddha, or an enlightened being would be so powerful as well. It is with uh, their interaction, um, the, the advice they give, the right view. Yeah, it is so helpful. But the wrong kind of information, wrong kind of saying, people can good be led astray and good relationships could be broken like a decades, you know, somebody would have been together and just very small incident and some people's big beautiful relationship come to an end. Yeah, we hear stories even amongst siblings, with partners, with even children, one argument one day. You know, so these things are sometimes the big sufferings in our lives. Sometimes it's not the financial problems or the health problems or the divorce or other things that are the main problems in our lives, but it is uh, our human interpersonal interactions that's, that uh, can affect our quality of life quite a lot yeah whether it goes up or down matters a lot so therefore it is really good to even recollect even whatever I'm going to share here today may not be uh, new anything new but the idea is sometimes we forget that's the problem it's not because we don't know what we need to do but we forget them so the idea of even having dhamma talks this is also a kind of an interaction action, a wholesome one, I hope, is also to bring into mind the things that are helpful and how to interact in a way that is useful for both parties, for one, oneself to the other person and to both. So um, I might read out a sutta. There is a very um, beautiful sutta. Um, <clears throat> it is from Anguttara Nikaya, Numerical Discourses, book number four, sutta number 32. Yeah, it's called Sustaining. Bhikkhus, or you can say bhikkhunis, and uh, uh, for its 
for everybody anyway. So there are these four means of sustaining a favorable relationship. What for? Giving, endearing speech, beneficent conduct, and impartiality. These are the four means of sustaining a favorable relationship. And that's the beautiful verse at the end. Giving endearing speech, beneficent conduct, and impartiality under uh, diverse worldly conditions as is suitable to fit each case. These means of sustaining a favorable relationship are like the linchpin of a rolling chariot. If there were no such means of sustaining a favorable relationship, neither mother nor father would be able to obtain esteem and veneration from their children. But since there exist this means of sustaining a favorable relationship, wise people respect them. Thus they attain to greatness and are highly praised. So this is one place that this sequence come up but this comes up in other places as well. So it's quite important to reflect the four things that the Buddha said here. There are other things that, the, the, there are other suttas as well, talks about other qualities, but this one is particularly about sustaining a favorable relationship. And number one is generosity of the heart, yeah, giving. Second one is about speech, endearing speech. And the third one is about your conduct. And the fourth one is including everybody, right? Impartiality. Quite important, isn't it? If you take a moment to think about these things. So when you talk about generosity, what do you give? Yeah, it's not just about giving as in material things, right? Giving a smile, yeah? Giving an act of service could come under there or under beneficial conduct, but giving with the open um, heart, right? Sharing Dhamma, uh, sharing important information, yeah? And even the giving your ear to listen to someone when they're distressed or a friend to talk to. So you can take a moment to see. Yeah, giving your time, so important, right? So difficult these days. Sometimes our children are trying to talk to us, but we are so busy, we don't look at them. Yeah, they're talking, but it's a kind thing. It's a, it's an act of giving, act of respect as well. When somebody's talking to you, to stop and look at them, yeah? And giving your time and make them feel that you listen. So these are all, all aspects of giving. So um, I have just started the process of your broad thinking about giving. But uh, when you have time, it is important to reflect, how can I improve and broaden my ways of giving? you have each kind of relationship what is helpful maybe in a certain relationship the part that is missing is maybe not listening you're giving not giving enough time not spending enough time together so what we need to give is our time in another kind of relationship it might be our care yeah in another kind of relationship it might be actually you know monetary things gifts or it could be an act of service. So you can bring to mind at a time when you're peaceful and when you're relaxed, thinking about the various relationships. If you want to increase the quality, increase the, the you know, things, or improve on a difficult relationship, try and see how can I give, what aspects are important. And if you think about us, you know, ourselves, we like to receive gifts, right? All those kinds of gifts. When we receive good advice, when we receive time from another person, 
love and affection, care, you know, a smile even, an act of service. We really feel happy because we feel we've been cared for, we've been loved, we've been heard. Yeah, that is what human beings need. We need kind of a thing when we interact with people. We need we all like to have respect, receive respect. We re like to receive affection. We'd like to receive kindness. Yeah, so it is really beautiful to think whatever we like to receive is also often what others like to receive. So this is the, a beautiful thing. And being receptive to see what is appropriate, what is helpful. Because thinking about giving a gift, this is another very interesting aspect about giving, right? So when it comes to giving, sometimes we give what we think is what they need. Yeah. We think, oh, they must, this must be good, or they have this health problem. I know about this new medicine. So you give. I mean, that's kind. Still, you're coming from a good place. But a gift, the sutra is about giving and how to give and what to give. But giving is very, very good when you actually find out from the person. Yeah, really helpful. What would you like to have? Yeah, this is important. <laughs> so, uh, and, and then giving a timely gift. Yeah, when something is needed, you give. Not when it is already excess. And it's already past time, not like that. And giving it with your own hands is also quite beautiful because, you know, that uh, uh, carries a lot of weight in kindness, care, respect, affection, all of those things. And, uh, yeah, there's quite a lot of things about giving. There's a beautiful suit that you want to read. Let me see whether there, I have it here. Um Uh, yeah, I haven't probably written it down here. So anyway, um, if you search, there's lots of uh, things about giving, but giving in that way, yeah, a timely gift, something that is beneficial um, and something you give unconditionally. That is the other thing. Sometimes when people give, things you sort of feel an obligation because the way they give makes you feel they sometimes even tell you make sure you use this yeah <laughs> yeah so you feel an obligation something comes attached with the gift then you feel uncomfortable isn't it yeah so giving an unconditional gift is very very helpful so an unconditional give and giving open-handedly yeah? giving freely without judging, without expecting anything back in return. So this is how the Buddha has expected. And it's not that easy to give, right? Not that easy to give in this way. Usually when we give, there are some small expectations from our hearts. And these are the things sometimes spoils a relationship. So I, you remember, oh, when they were sick, I looked after them. And I am sick. And they're not looking after me. They should be looking after me if they're my friend or my family. And you get upset. Or you remember, oh, for their birthday, I gave this really nice thing and I gave them a card and they did nothing for my birthday. <laughs> or anything like this, right? So, so sometimes it's really important to reflect how to give an unconditional gift. I received a very beautiful advice from my father when I was about six or seven years of age. I was very fortunate to receive this advice so young. My father was also quite a very generous person. He was quite kind, but also very, very generous. And of course, what you see is what you kind of also do. So I was sort of following him. Uh, as a little child. So I also started to have this habit of wanting to give also material gifts as well. 
So when he noticed that I was uh, taking after him in this habit of giving, then one day he actually gave me a very powerful advice that I remember, which I would like to share with you, which improves and helps with uh, relationships when it comes to giving. Because giving is helpful, but if you if you give it in if you give in the wrong way, it can be counterproductive productive in a relationship. So this is what my father give, gave me this advice, but it is not uh, different to the advice of the Buddha when you think about unconditional giving. So the first thing he said, when you're about to give something to somebody, also think about whether are you happy if they don't say thank you. Yeah, because sometimes you give a gift and you expect the person to say thank you and you get upset or they didn't say thank you, they didn't acknowledge my gift. And when my father said that, I thought about it and I said, okay, never mind, yeah, I can deal with it, that's all right, I can give and if the person didn't say thank you, that's okay. And the second advice, he said, after giving, if you didn't do back in return, is that okay? So you give somebody a gift on their birthday and they don't give you a gift back. Are you going to get hurt or can you deal with it? They don't do a favor in return. I thought about it and I thought, well, that's okay. Yeah, I'm happy to give and uh, not expect anything in return from them to do something similar back to me. That's fine. That's okay. So that was the second one. But the third one was the really unexpected one because these two you sort of expect, right? Because these are your ordinary expectations that somebody would say thank you and somebody would do something in return to you and being able to let that go. That was okay. That one he said was, are you also ready if they treat you badly, do something really bad to you even if you have done something nice, given a gift, and in return, they do something that is hurtful and harmful to you, are you able to deal with that when that happens? Or are you going to get upset when that happens? Now, that I didn't expect. I was thinking, how come somebody who I've been kind to, who have given a gift, do something really bad to me? What is he saying? Yeah. May... You know, relate to this. So have me have heard stories about this and agree how true this is. Yeah, it is sometimes the people that we have helped, we have gone out of the way to help. We've given gifts and many ways of uh, supporting them. And these people sometimes have turned around and stabbed us on the back. This happens in the world. This is life in samsara. This is human beings with defilement. So this can be expected because at the time, when we give, we don't know who we are giving to fully, right? And people also change over time. Maybe at the time, they were a nice, good person. But over time, maybe things happened. And uh, that's why, because you sometimes hear stories. I certainly hear this from time to time. At the monastery, people come and say, you know, I lost my job, they say. What happened? He said, you know, there was this person who newly migrated, one of our friends. So I helped them to get a job in my company. <laughs> and a few months down the track, it, or a few years down the track, it was that person who somehow got this person fired. You hear this story. Yeah. So somebody who you help sometimes turn around. So we have to be ready. Yeah. Because otherwise, this is when real suffering starts to come. I'm not saying that this is correct, yeah? I'm not saying what they're doing is correct. But the thing is, it's from our side. How does that affect me? Are you able to make peace with the world when the world does all sorts of stuff, yeah? Yeah, this is the thing because we can't control other people, right? What we receive, we can receive it in a way that is helpful to us or at least we can stop the harm that it's going to cause, okay? If they are being unskillful and harmful, well, they will have their karmic retribution for that. Yeah, but if I um, sort of, you know, move away from it and just uh, 
accept it or you of course put your boundaries and things like that if they try to be abusive but in in this occasion it's you know um getting hurt that's the part that i'm talking about or getting angry is the part because and getting angry or getting hurt about on account of other people's um, uh, acts isn't useful. So then other people get in the way of our happiness. But that, uh, that doesn't mean that you allow or them to continue to hurt us and do terrible things. Of course, you need to take actions. Yeah. So that is another aspect of this where you can find ways to put your boundaries and find solutions to the issue uh, that that's, uh, that's a whole another Dharma topic. <laughs> but you take those actions, not allow people to harm you. But when they, they do that, not getting hurt, not getting angry, not getting sad, those negative emotions coming up, see whether you are able to deal with it. Because usually what happens is, I did this, I did that, how come they do this to me? And that is the start of a break. But sometimes if you dealt with that one okay. When they did something silly that is unskillful. And if you are able to skillfully navigate through this in a way, in the sense that you don't uh, respond back with negativity, but uh, you respond back with wisdom. And I have to be very careful in uh, talking about this because if it is a very difficult person, an abusive person, then we have to uh, protect ourselves. So I'm saying that. But in general, if it is uh, not such a difficult situation, a scary situation or traumatic situation, like our ordinary uh, difficult situation, if you are able to accept them and stay peaceful and then later on, you know, talk about it when they are ready and then continue to do your little acts of kindness to them, then the relationship may become good and they might realize what they have done and they might even come and say sorry and ask for forgiveness and the relationship or the friendship may continue instead of ending it for life. Because this is what happens sometimes, right? Sometimes it's one off thing. Sometimes we all do silly things in our life, triggered by so many things, yeah? Strong defilements come in, you know, situations, conditions, things like when, you know, people, the things that we heard people did when COVID came, right? Yeah. Like outrageous things people did to friends and even, even to family because when they were scared about their own death, on their life, own life, yeah, they did terrible things. But, you know, um, if we are able to forgive, understand, and, you know, deal with it in a skillful, good way, we can still have these people back in our life if they are still good people. Yeah, sometimes it's not saying somebody is a criminal, a bad person, an abuser or something. Sometimes they have may, may have done one or two acts in those, you know, unskillful acts. But their whole being is not really terrible. They have other good qualities, yeah? And people also change. So that is why it's important to be ready for these things so you can guard your own feelings so you are not at the mercy <laughs> of other people. And, uh, you know, what they do is affecting us and you go up and down, uh, but you can protect. Because sometimes some people lose the interest to give and serve when they have this kind of experience. And what a sad thing that is, yeah? Because you see some people stop giving because they've had difficult experiences in their life. And that is, uh, it's uh, not a benefit for oneself because giving uh, is extremely beneficial even for oneself. Giving has benefits for um, oneself as the giver, the benefit for the person who is receiving. Yeah. So therefore, this and and many other people as well who may benefit from that. So therefore, this is why this having this uh, right understanding about how to give unconditional gift is so helpful. And this is the 
advice of the Buddha. And when we have given unconditional gifts, that is when we can also do the meditation, which is called Chaga Nusati. If you read about that, uh, it comes up if you want a reference in numerical discourses, uh, chapter book 11, uh, Mahanama Sutta, maybe it's Sutta number 11 as well, somewhere around there. Uh, the, but you can do that and when you have given open-handedly, yeah, free-handedly, and gift of unconditional gift. So this is about giving, to give successfully in a good way so that it Im improves and enhance a relationship. So the second one is endearing speech. Yeah, and in other places, also in the uh, Buddhist monastic code, in the Vinaya Pitaka, the Buddha says, even for the monastic community, yeah, how to speak words goes to the heart. Yeah, you need, nice to hear, right? Words that goes to the heart, to your fellow monastics. Speak words that goes to the heart, both in private and in public. Yeah, you know the difference? Because sometimes when we are in public, we, you know, communicate nicely. But when we are in private, it's another story. Please don't do that. Yeah, both yeah, your behavior has to be consistent, both in public and in private. So even the Buddha says, you know, the way you give your bodily actions also has to be very loving, affectionate, and kind. And even the way you look at your fellow monastics, your fellow people, look with eyes, with love and affection and kindness. Yeah, Because these are all ways of communication, isn't it? It is endearing speech, but if when it comes to communication, you communicate not just only with words, you communicate with your entire being, yeah? So this goes both ways, the way of expression and a way of listening and hearing. So this is, again, extremely very helpful. And it is in one of the books that uh, Anukampa has published that's called uh, Opening Up to Kindfulness. I think some years ago, uh, such a book was uh, done through Anukampa and it is available, the free uh, publication, a PDF is available and there is a beautiful chapter called Total Listening by Ajahn Brahm. This is, of course, a book by Ajahn Brahm. And there is a really beautiful way of how to listen. And this goes, this is such an important aspect of relationships, isn't it? Yeah, a lot of the time the problem is our inability to hear somebody. And the problem with human beings, the problem with human beings is this. I may have said this before, but it is always nice to say it again and again. Yeah, and this is this sutta. I can't remember the reference, unfortunately. Uh, in this sutta, there is this elephant trainer called Pesa. And he comes to um, the Buddha and then the Buddha engages in conversation, just a small chat first. And he asks, oh, Pesa, how do you train the elephants? Elephants, these wild elephants are scary. How do you get them to be like your backhoe and do all the work? Because at the time of the Buddha, those days, they didn't have backhoes. They used elephants to do all the heavy work. So how do you train elephants? And he said, oh, Bante, training elephants is very easy. Because when I walk an elephant from one city to the next, they show themselves. So I get to understand a wise elephant from the stupid one, a kind one from the aggressive one, the one with too much energy, with the one that is not with energy, the, one, the elephant who is sick and an elephant is very healthy and all these other aspects, you know, they show themselves. And then our family line has developed so many different techniques to apply to the different kind of elephant. So when I know them, I can apply it and I can train the elephant so easily. But then he says, but Bante, how do you train human beings? He says, but human beings, on the one other hand, they think one thing. They open their mouth and say something else. 
and then they go and do something else altogether. So this is not in alignment. What we think, what we say, and what we do are really in perfect alignment. I mean, that is to be expected as well in a way. This is the nature of defiled minds. So usually this is a quality special to a Buddha to have perfect alignment. It is in Pali. Yatavadi, tatakari, tatakari, yatavadi. One does what they say and they say what they do. Yeah, it's a rare quality. But, you know, our job is to try and align as much as possible. So this is where the problem in relationships can come. You can even record the conversation and say, see, you said you don't want it. You said no to this. But why are you complaining now? Yeah. In, in words, in the communication, they have said no. But if you actually was there paying attention to the body language, they were shouting it out saying, yes, I want it. But they said, no, 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 I don't need it. It's okay. It's fine. I don't need it. But, but they're really wanting it. So this is what we are trying to say. This is where there's a big problem that comes up in relationships that we misunderstood people because we value just the word and we only listen to the word. But we forgot the human beings with great difficulty in expressing in a very honest and correct way. Yeah, it's difficult. And we know about this in ourselves, right? We How we behave, sometimes we don't express exactly what we want to because of many reasons. Sometimes we feel that if we express exactly, maybe the other person might get hurt and that's probably why. Or because maybe it is our own ego that doesn't want to say. Maybe it is the etiquette or maybe whatever, the culture, uh, you know, the society, the upbringing, whatever it is, there is this difficulty. So therefore, learning to listen, even the words um, can express something that is not true or correct or the in the wrong way, usually the bodies rarely lie. You have to be a very trained spice or somebody to be able to, uh, you know, over outdo that. Usually if you're not a trained person to, you know, deceive your bodily way of expressing, usually normal people, uh, you can read the body and body usually tells the true information. So in a relationship, it is important um, how to listen with your whole body to a person. So that is where interpersonal, like in real time, in person, communication is very, very helpful. Zoom is the next best, but of course, in the same room, if you're ever able to hold a hand, give a hug, and see the person eye to eye, because it's very hard on Zoom to see eye contact, right? So these are all helpful means for this endearing speech. Yeah, endearing speech is also about talking with your eyes, with your whole body language, not just the beautiful words that get together. You could even be saying a poem, a love poem even. But you know, it, it has to have much more into it for it to be endearing. So we like endear to receive endearing speech. So the Buddha says endearing speech is a helpful aspect of a relationship. And the third one is beneficent conduct. So this is really also about our sila, yeah? Whether whatever we do by body, speech, and mind, um, is it hurtful and harmful for oneself and the other and for both? And also is that beneficial? Because sometimes we do many, many acts uh, that are actually not really beneficial, quite empty and hollow. And sometimes it is those that get us into trouble. Yeah, this is, uh, even though this is an act of speech, when it comes to conduct, it's not just by body, I suppose, but also the speech. But sometimes what happens, we may be joking, yeah? And some, some people get hurt because of a joke. And this is quite a common way of, uh, problems happening in a relationship. You meant well, maybe, or you thought it was funny, but the other person took it in a personal way or in a way that is a bit harmful for themselves. So 
jokes sometimes can be helpful. I have to be very careful because Ajahn Brahm tells a lot of jokes in a skillful way to tell Dhamma. So, you know, there is a skillful way of using jokes, but there are also unskillful way or not beneficial ways just because you just tell stories and um, useless uh, chatter called idle speech is to be avoided. So it's so about your conduct. Yeah. So these can go on forever. So my job is not to go into all the different ways of the conduct, but time is also running. So it's about reflecting. How am I conducting myself? Yeah. So if you live in a community, sometimes we forget. Yeah, there are other people. It's a communal space. So to do things in a way that are, you know, you leave the place uh, how you found it in a way, or if you found it dirty, still clean it up, yeah? You tidy it up. That's beautiful advice by the Buddha when for the monastics. In, in If you go to a toilet, they say, when you come out, it should be left better than how you found it, yeah? So do a little bit extra cleaning, shine, we polish the toilet seat, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, make it nice and welcoming for the other person. And it's nice, yeah, especially if you live in a family, in a community with other people or in a situation where you have at work. It's nice, right, if you didn't leave your coffee mug around in the sink unwashed. Yeah, things like that. And microwave, if your food spilled, you clean it up. These are really simple, practical things. But you can see how these things very quickly escalate into a big argument and problems. So. It's really, really nice to reflect when you, how can you do things in a way that it is not causing difficulty? How is your conduct, yeah, affecting other people? The way you look, the way you speak, the way you do things, yeah? And sometimes you can't get it right straight away because we only know so much. But it is by observing, yeah? So learning from our mistakes, seeing other people's reactions, having that sensitivity, really hard, yeah? Really hard sometimes because we are full with our, ourselves, with, with our business, our life, and we forget to notice and we go about being stressed, being busy, being worried or whatever, and do things that are very inconvenient and difficult for the people around us. And then this makes problems even more. So developing that sensitivity to see how your actions, how your conduct is affecting the people around you is really helpful for beneficial um, relationships. So again, it's kind of like homework, bringing into your mind, remembering conduct. Yeah, how do you behave? And the fourth one is uh, impartiality. Yeah, this is so important, so important to include people, inclusivity, yeah, because how how painful it is when you feel being excluded, isn't it? When, when you feel being excluded is so painful. But see whether do you exclude your children when you have a conversation. Sometimes you think, oh, they're too little to participate and make decisions. Yeah, they may be too little, but still you can make them feel that they're there. Yeah, you can ask them what kind of, you know, what color do you like to paint the walls? And they might say hot pink or purple or a color that is maybe not suitable. But you can still ask them the question and then they can, you can also say what you like and what you think hot pink might not be appropriate in this location, but just engaging, right? Not just, not just thinking, oh, they're too small, but make them feel that they're being included. It's so important, yeah? When I see this happening, I have so much joy. Sometimes you see uh, some families come and you see some parents talk the way they talk with even their three-year-old little kid. It's so beautiful. Like, you know, they ask, I, I sometimes wonder, what does the kid know about this? But still, you know, you make them feel included. And it's so nice. And that's how the kids also learn how to be inclusive. Yeah. But if they felt as a child being a bit excluded, um, then it becomes difficult. You forget and you don't get that habit, uh, uh, that practice. So 
uh, you know, so inclusivity and treating everybody in a good way, yeah, in a good way, in a um, impartiality, yeah, because when we feel that as we favor somebody and not favor a other person, treat people differently, this causes so much conflict and difficulty, yeah. So it is difficult as well, but trying our very best to be impartial. So the Buddha says in impartiality, we have to do it with wisdom and, uh, and what is appropriate. The, the idea is not giving the same portion. Like let's say um, you have like a big kid and a small kid. So it's not the amount of food you give that it has to be equal amount. That's not certainly true, right? A big kid would need a bigger volume. The small little baby needs only a small amount. So that's that's not how you think being fair, not giving equal amount, but what is necessary you give them and what is appropriate you give them and you make them feel they are being treated in a favorable, kind, good way. Yeah, so again, it's a big subject uh, and I'm still learning uh, these things myself and learning from your mistakes as well, how um, it hasn't worked. So that's another very important aspect. So the four things in this sutta that comes up is um, giving, endearing speech, beneficent conduct and impartiality. But in other places in the suttas and other places in the teachings and in your own life, you also know there are these three other fundamental principles. This I have also found myself to be very helpful in any relationship and also especially to when, when, when we feel challenges, you know, during our life. We come across various difficult challenges and to navigate through those challenging times and come out in a good way. How do you do that? And for that, the three, I have found also these design sutras, the three fundamental principles that have been very helpful is having mutual affection, mutual respect, and mutual trust. These things go together, yeah? If you truly have affection for somebody, it is quite natural that you will have respect for these people or this person. When you have this affection and respect, there is a natural trust. And you give the benefit of the doubt often if you come across something that is a bit difficult, you suddenly remember, actually, they didn't mean to hurt me. They didn't do it in purpose to make it difficult for me because you trust that they care about you, that they have respect for you. Maybe it was a mistake they didn't realize or something like this. So this is where this kind of trust is important. So these have to be very careful because there are lots of relationship problems because of the breaking up of the trust and, and things like that. But if it is real, if you can build up affection, respect and trust in a very solid way in a relationship and maintaining this is also difficult depending on the other party. But when you give, hopefully the other person will give back as well. And building it up together goes a long way. So it takes a long time to build trust, but to lose trust is very easy, right? So with one uh, moment of mindlessness, sometimes trust can be lost. But that is where you hear again and again from Ajahn Brahm too, right? He asked the question, how many times should we you forgive somebody? It's always one more time, right? He always forgives. It's incredible the ability of Ajahn Brahm as an indi individual, how he forgives you. Yeah, because he trusts you to be, even I'm not... Uh, I'm, you know, this is not, I'm not proud to say this, but you know, even I have been sometimes a, quite a scallywag <laughs> well, daughter for him, like a spiritual daughter doing, you know, difficult things, arguing with him or giving him a hard time or doing what he asked me not to do or not keeping, you know, 
what he, his advice. Sometimes we are like that. Sometimes we can be a bit stubborn and naughty and do things. And later you realize, oh, that was a really bad thing. That was terrible. And you go and ask for forgiveness. Yeah. And he smiles and he forgives you every time. This is such a beautiful thing to experience. Yeah. When you receive this forgiveness from somebody. And I wonder, and I tell him sometimes, you know, I'm still capable of reoffending. You know, I'm not fully done yet. I might make the same mistakes a few more times. He says, then he asked me, are you able to forgive yourself when that happens? I said, I suppose so, because I understand maybe, you know, I'm still, you know, have defilements and, you know, I have some bad conditioning maybe. So I can maybe, he says, okay. Then think about taking two steps up, one step down, and keep going like that. So this is how you forget. So so beautiful, yeah. When somebody you love and somebody you care uh, are able to forgive you when you do mistakes. So in the same way, if you are able to forgive somebody, also very beautiful, yeah. So this is really nice. And how do you do that? Because you trust the person to be fundamentally a good person. But good people do stupid things from time to time. So you understand them, yeah? You accept them. You allow them to be. And this is such a beautiful thing to do in our relationships, not to really jump into conclusions just because of one act to completely cut them out and push them aside and uh, not to do like that, yeah? So it is really beautiful to be able to develop this ability to really truly forgive somebody by understanding, using right view, yeah, and understanding that. And to ask for forgiveness, to be forgiven, is a very, another very important aspect of uh, beneficial relationships. And uh, I'm sure being students of Ajahn Brahm and Ajahn Hassel, Ajahn Chanda, you have heard this and done this practice. But if you haven't, yeah, if you haven't, try doing this, yeah, with your beautiful close relationships from time to time. Take the time and make the other person feel that you really mean it and really say, you know, I really care about you. You know, but I am not perfect. Maybe there are things over a period of time that I have done or not done, said or not said, that has been hurtful or harmful to you. I would really like to ask for forgiveness. You know, I really didn't mean to really hurt or harm you, but sometimes, you know, silly things can happen. And ask whether, you know, and, and, and allowing the other person to do the same. And you feel a beautiful release from your heart. Yeah, it's really, it really feels in the chest. So very often we have this tightness that we experience and we don't even know from where and what it is coming. And sometimes this is coming from accumulation of very small things. Yeah, the very small things over a period of time builds up. And, and then you don't even know, but it feels really difficult. But when we ask for forgiveness or when we forgive somebody, then there is a beautiful release and a, the relationship renews in a very beautiful way. So try this out as well. It is some, sometimes very hard because sometimes our ego gets in the way. I, In fact, I didn't do anything wrong that they did something. They should ask forgiveness first or say sorry first. Yeah. So these are the things sometimes we don't do it and we never end up and later we regret when the person passes away. So it's important that uh, we take the initiative, even if they may have been the person who did the thing, you can still initiate the process and say your side of behavior and ask for forgiveness. Because, um, you know, all these people, our loved ones may not last forever. We may not last forever. It's not such a nice, comfortable way to die, yeah, with unresolved business with our close people. So even though if it is difficult, because it is difficult, that is why we push it to one side and delay it. But one day it might be too late. So don't delay these things, yeah, to say sorry, to ask for forgiveness, have this beautiful conversation and have uh, find the right time and do it, but it is important. 
but uh, I might stop here because uh, there's only about another 10 minutes left, I think, before it uh, goes to an hour for questions. But there's many more things to be said about this subject and you can read about this uh, in suttas, yeah. Okay. <laughs> If you raise mm. your Zoom hand, I can unmute you. Uh, Venerable, thank you very much. Um, just because nobody's saying anything, I thought I'd just take the time to thank you. And I thought the comments about the boundaries, you know, mm -hmm. I, I think that's such an important part of all of this. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. be because there is the danger of getting attached to the to the giving uh, mm. and then it becomes unhelpful on so many levels perhaps for all concerned so thank you for making that mm. point that it's it's always good to hear sometimes that is not always included in in what I come across so I, I was very grateful to hear that thank you very much thank you for that comment yes yeah thank you so um, if there is a little bit of time, I can also mention this is if I can find the reference. Let me see where I find it's about uh, beneficial speech. There's a nice sutta. I think it is in uh, uh, numerical discourses, book number five, sutta number 198. So this is again with the communication. The Buddha talks about five things to consider before we talk, before we speak. Yeah. So I won't take too much time to talk about in detail the five things, but even just mentioning them, because these are not things that you don't know. But remembering this while we are on this subject of relationships and stuff, uh, the Buddha says, before you speak, see whether it's the right time. Yeah. And what is the wrong time to speak? A wrong time is when we are emotionally triggered or when the other party is emotionally triggered. You can be 100% sure the communication would not be as good as if you spoke at a time when you are, the both parties are much more peaceful. Because with emotions comes defilements and with anger or with sadness or with worry, if we speak, it's always not a skillful speech. So we... We spoil the issue. So right time. In the sutta, it doesn't say the right place, but I take it that when the Buddha says right time, right place is also included because we understand where we speak is also important, isn't it? The place matters a lot. You don't say something very, you know, personal in public when everybody else is there, right? You right find the right kind of time and place to say things. So this is uh, good. So right place. Second thing that the Buddha says is, see whether what you're going to say is true. Because sometimes a lot of the arguments happen at the end of the argument, you realize actually that didn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> because you have just got some cues and you sort of um, assumed something happened and proliferated into a big story, but that's not what has happened. So before we speak, find out whether the information is actually true. That saves many arguments and many difficulties in relationships because we uh, the information is not true. The third one to consider is, is this beneficial? Because, you know, sometimes the time has passed 
But sometimes our ego still wants to make a point. So it's like, just use, just so you know, you know, and you say this, but it doesn't really do anything beneficial, but only make the other person feel a bit bad that they did something wrong, but it's not beneficial. But sometimes if you talk about a past experience in a good way to learn from it, to go move forward, that's beneficial. But there are many times, sometimes people engage in an unbeneficial way. There is no benefit to that conversation. Then the Buddha says, no need to speak. So time, right? Is it the right time? Is it true? Is it beneficial? And the next one is, um, is it gentle speech? So this is where the in the modern days, it's the, the term used is nonviolent communication. There's so much out there about nonviolent communication. So how you speak, how you phrase, the tone of your voice, everything goes in. Yeah. So nonviolent communication. Even the Buddha mentioned about it, gentle speech. Gentle is not just about being very sweet, because there are some people who can speak very sweetly, but they really stab you, right? <laughs> so this is where so gentle speech is not just being sweet. It. It's how you speak, what you say, how you say, all of those things. And we don't victimize the person. So this is really important. And the fifth one is where is it coming from? Is it coming from a heart with loving kindness, a heart of affection? Do you have affection in your heart as you speak? And this is the challenging part, right? If you're about to have a difficult communication with somebody you find difficult, how are you going to have affection in your heart? So you have more work to do. You have to prepare yourself beforehand, especially, yeah? Because then you have to see if this difficult person has some good qualities. So you have to focus on their good qualities first and build up a bit of, you know, good feelings for the person. Not only for have focus their bad qualities and already feeling irritated and agitated, and then trying to speak is not going to be helpful. Because we know this, right? When somebody speaks and even tells you something that is difficult, but if you feel that they're actually coming from a place of affection, kindness, care, you are able to take it, even if they said no, when they you, they, you wanted them to say yes. But you are able to accept that no. When you realize they're actually coming from a place of kindness. So it is uh, not what you say so much, but how you say it, yeah? So if it is coming, so it's so important for this, um, especially to deal with difficult communication preparation, yeah? Finding the right time. Is it the information true? Is it beneficial? Is it spoken gently, spoken with a heart of loving kindness, with metta? So this is, again, the Buddha's advice. A beautiful thing to reflect, to improve our relationships. So, yeah, that's the last thing I might share. But uh, thank you all for listening and thank you all for being there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And thank uh, you, you Venerable. Um, there's a couple of, couple of thank yous in the uh, chat as well. One saying, so timely, thank you very much. And another saying, thank you so much um, to the wonderful, for the wonderful sermon. Thank you very much. Thank this you. is very helpful. And thank you, Venerable. So many thank yous coming in the text. <laughs> and uh, and uh, thank you from all of us, Venerable, and uh, for waking up at four o'clock and <laughs> just having a very small time to have your coffee and rushing for us and uh, giving this wonderful sermon. And um, um, all the, the notes that you gave on the sutta references and the book, and uh, it's so valuable. So thank you so much and thank you for the community as well. So for um, being patient with us and uh, staying and we managed to uh, take a bit of 20 minutes uh, uh, playing back Venerable's last year meditation. Uh, and uh, so we were planning to do the whole talk as <laughs> if we have a technical difficulty. So thank you very much for staying with us. And uh, and thank you very much for being part of the Anukampa uh, com community as well, supporting the Anukampa Bhikkhuni project and Venerable Chanda. 
um, and making this community uh, provide a good service like these Dhamma talks, teachings, retreats, meditation retreats, and so many things. And so hope uh, you will be with us uh, in the long term and being part of the community. If you are able to, you can get involved financially. You can donate, give a dana. When when repairs come, you can do a food dana. Um, you can uh, you can contact team at anukampaproject.org and uh, uh, book those things and. Uh, from December, you can see whether there's any needy items, um, and uh, if you if you can volunteer, um, you can you can uh, you know talk to the team at as well for that. Um, and uh, thank you very much again for um, you know all the donations that are coming and to make the Anukampa community sustainable as well. Thank you. Thank you. See you again next time.